monumental miscellanea, and funerary paraphernalia. It's Archeodeath. Hello, I'm Professor Howard Williams and welcome to my presentation Offers Dyke a Watery Perspective. Now, um, this presentation has been designed for presentation to the Chester Society for Landscape History, but because of the pandemic lockdowns and, 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 and restrictions we've been uh, enduring, uh, we, agree, we agree between us that I would present and share this on YouTube and subsequently I would have a live session with the Society to answer further follow-up questions about Offers Dyke and its watery context. And uh, this hopefully will create a resource for everyone else out there to add comments and, and, and get involved in the Offers Dyke Collaboratory and about uh, how we research offers dikes. I hope this is a broader, useful resource. So welcome. Um, you are attending the first half of a two-part activity for the Chester Society for Landscape History, but I hope this is a standalone uh, useful presentation for you. And I'm going to sort of break it down into two parts, I think. I'm going to have this first part, which will give you the background, and then I'll do a second video that takes you through my uh, data and approaches. So, uh, let's move on. The background I want to start with, which is the context for me being involved in Offers Dyke, is obviously I work at the University of Chester in a borderland zone, and you, some of you may be aware that I conducted field work at the Pillar of Elizeg near uh, Clangothlan in the Vale of Clangothlan, um, and I'm interested therefore in early medieval archaeology in this region that was going to become the Anglo-Welsh borderlands. It wasn't at the time. Wales didn't exist and England didn't exist. Um, but I'm interested in that formative process of early medieval borderland creation and the Mercian Kingdom's western frontiers. Now, we, in that light, I was co-organiser, co-founder co and co-convener, sorry, I should say, of the Offers Dyke Collaboratory. Now, this is a research network established in 2017 involving a range of organisations and partners and stakeholders to develop um, new active research and provide resources to facilitate that research. And we've created a website with 131 blogs, if not more. Um, there's details of the conveners. You can become a member if you're an active researcher on the landscapes of the Anglo-Welsh borders. Walls and borderland monuments, past and present, or broader frontier zones, past and present. You can simply email me and we'll add your name and affiliation, if applicable, to our website. We've had a series of key events. And there is a host of documents and resources, which I'll come on to in the rest of the presentation. So there's a, there's a lot of things to, uh, um, to, to read on the website. So the website is itself a valuable resource uh, for anyone interested in that. And we've also had a series of meetings, an inaugural workshop at the University of Centre Shrewsbury, and an academic conference, and um, a heritage workshop, a, a public conference involving amateur groups and local communities, a um, student conference, which I'm actually writing up and publishing right now, um, last year. And this year we had a conservation and, and research forum in, in, organised by Professor Keith Ray at Cardiff University. And because of the lockdown, we went digital with our, our Trevonan uh, Heritage Day, um, um, a, a conference that went digital and a lot of the resources you can find on Twitter or on my blog, or on the blog, sorry, and my Archeodeath blog as well, and also through this YouTube channel. A lot of the presentations were uploaded there, including a virtual tour of Offers Dyke at Trevonan with me in a silly hat and jacket. So that's what we've been doing in terms of events with the Collaboratory, and we're hoping to build new projects, developing a research agenda, new fieldwork projects taking place by a range of organisations, but within um, uh, communication with each other through the Collaboratory. Um, we do hope to foster more community archaeology in terms of survey and uh, excavation. Um, provide fresh perspectives and synergies of research, and I think we've done that through our meetings. And one of the key outputs of the Offers Dyke Collaboratory is the Offers Dyke Journal, that we now have an academic journal dedicated to the study of linear monuments, frontiers and borderlands, walls, if you like, past and present. We've called it the Offers Dyke Journal, not so that we only focus on Offers Dyke, but because Offers Dyke and the Collaboratory has been the inspiration for this open access digital resource. And already we've published the first volume, Open Access, but also subsequently available for purchase through the Archive. Press uh, website 
Um, so you can read it online as a PDF or you can buy it as a, as a book. Um, the Office Night Journal, Volume 1. That's co-edited by myself and my doctoral researcher, Liam Delaney, who's uh, Liam will come, probably be mentioned later in the presentation. And we're just pulling together Volume 2 for 2020. We've got four articles published online already. And we have, uh, I said one to two here, but definitely two um, more plus the introduction to be completed so it should be fully available by November 2020 and we've got a call for papers out for Office Night Journal Volume 3 for 2021. So my point is that together we have produced and we have created a a, a website, a, a set of events but also a concrete result in the form of a digital and real physical journal that is able to provide student scholars and interested parties with a resource um, for developing their research so that everyone's aware of the latest ideas. I wanted to give you that as a background to my talk so you have a sense of why this is a timely and pertinent topic and particularly following the publication of Keith Ray and Ian Baptist 2016 book Offers Dyke Landscape and Hegemony in 8th century uh, Britain you we are in a new era of research on the monument and let, let me start off by introducing Offers Dyke uh, Britain's longest ancient monument um, and some of the recent thinking about it before I embark into my research and what I want have yet to publish but on my ongoing research on the watery interactions. Now this map by Liam Delaney I feel is the best one to give you an, a sense of the navigation of, of how the monument navigates through the landscape. So you can see the surviving monument starts in the north in Trevonon in, in, in southern Flintshire and there's a debate still going on and uh, my colleague Professor Keith Ray has been discussing whether we do have sections of it um, through Flintshire, long discounted, but actually there are some tantalising clues there. But we have it dem demonstrated and everyone agrees we find it here in north Flintshire. Uh, and then we can trace the line of the monument southwards across the River Dee through northwest Shropshire into Montgomeryshire, now Powys, hitting the River Severn and then using the River Severn for a, a section before we pick it up again, heading through um, the Clun Forest and into Radnorshire and then into Herefordshire. And there's again been debates about whether it continues across the, the Herefordshire um, uh, plain towards the River Wye. But we now, my, my doctoral researcher Liam Delaney seems to be conclusively linking up these stretches um, through his LIDAR research. And then the River Wye seems to provide the frontier down to what is now Gloucestershire and where we have the the remains of the monument continuing down following the River Wise Eastern Bank and the and the valley side above it down to Sedbury Cliffs. So that's the monument as we understand it today and those familiar with the work of Hill and Worthington in their 2003 book discount um, this southern section as part of Offers Dyke and they they do suggest there is no northern section um, but there are now as I said arguments being made by Ray and Bapti and now by my doctoral researcher Lynn Delaney to suggest those are parts of the same integrated frontier. And Ray and Bapti, I think, argue, well, while we don't have a precise date for the monument as yet, although uh, Cluid Powys Archaeological Trust excavations in Chirk Park have produced a date, which will be published in due course, that might be of interest and value and interest to people. But I don't want to speak for them and their ongoing research. But um, what I would say is that the... Um, the, the monument as we understand it is undated but does seem to be of a singular design in other words it does date to a single period and I think that's important we can't conclusively say it's a late 8th century and it's the work of offer but I think we can see it as part of a vision to create a linear monument that is not a border and, I, and there's an anachronism of seeing it like a modern border, but it is trying to control a frontier zone. It may have had military, socio-economic functions. It perhaps, though, wasn't a territorial marker, but was a way of controlling movement through the landscape in peace and war.
So understanding this as a monument that ran to wall in the Welsh, to block in the Welsh, is a perhaps a later simplification and misunderstanding of a more complex and uh, um, aspiration of the Mercian kingdom based in the Trent Valley originally in uh, Staffordshire and Derbyshire to extend westwards and to control this its western marches, western reaches. It, it's not a border, but it's part, an integral feature of a borderland that was still contested and fluid and continue to be contested and fluid up to the Norman conquest and through past the Norman conquest and with the formalization of, 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 of marcher lordships to control this, this landscape. This is a very useful pair of visuals to help explain that frontier zone to you a bit better um, because it is a landscape monument, not only because it's on a massive scale and cut across a complex ancient landscape of where upland and lowland meet, river courses, Roman roads, prehistoric settlement sites, Iron Age hill forts, but also it's a landscape monument because it was about controlling a landscape, a zone. And when we're talking about a landscape zone, we think to its west and to its east. So this useful, um, I, I have qualified it by saying I don't quite believe that, that uh, Stuart Brooks's phase one and phase two are exact ways in which linear work, earthworks worked, operated. But still, it does make an important point about the evolution from the 8th, 9th century through to uh, the defence in depth, depth approach that we see Wessex adopting in the 10th, 11th century of Burrs um, being at the focus of a, a road network, beacon and watchtower and, and manorial sites. Um, in, in, in a borderland zone. But, but the phase one, I think he does make clear, is that the linear earthwork is about protection, uh, not simply of livestock, as he would say here, but about movement of people in times of peace and war between a borderland on either side. So I don't quite agree with his characterization of the western side being the border, but I would say that the linear earthwork runs through a borderland that extended to the west and the east. And I think that's what Stuart Brooks's visual really makes clear to us here. The, the borderland extends to the east and to the west of this monument. And I think Tim Malin's map here from his 2007 article showing you, well, the Whitford dyke he includes in this map, but let's not discuss that. It does seem now to be discounted from the early medieval period. It does seem to be a prehistoric monument. But we have, there are possible traces of Offa's dyke in the north, but here is the same line that Liam shows, roughly, of uh, the purple being Offa's dyke. Um, although Liam has pursued it further in his map. If you remember, it comes up and around the Simmons Yat Bend there, um, doesn't on, on this map. But anyway, it gives you a sense of where Office Dyke runs, and the yellow line is Watts Dyke, um, now thought to be a slightly later, contemporary or later, uh, Mercian frontier linear earthwork. I won't talk about that today. That will be the focus of another presentation I shall be delivering via YouTube and to another local society in a few weeks. Um, but you can get a sense of how it interacts with this complex landscape of the intersection between uplands and lowlands, blocking uh, routes on land and water-based routes. And when I say water routes, I don't mean that necessarily people are transporting in large ships over these very, um, the, the torrents and shallow waters of the Dee, the Vanwe and the upper reaches of the Severn necessarily. But I would argue that these are uh, avenues of communication along the banks of the of the D and the the arrow and the Y and so on. These are arteries of communication and resources in themselves. Now, Eric Grigg has estimated that this could have been built, offers like could have been built in one season by perhaps up to five and a half thousand men, labourers, people. But I happen to feel that that might be a slight underestimation in terms of his his book from 2018, based on his doctoral thesis, goes through the sort of the, the labour of digging a ditch in a bank. But I think that Offers Dyke was probably always more than that in terms of the need for construction, but also maintenance. And we also have to factor in the labour of constructing this huge work for at least 85 miles, but perhaps much longer in sections where we've lost it. That includes the, the construction and personnelling of beacons, watchtowers, gates, settlements that, uh, and forts that supply and support this linear earthwork, of which we know very little. 
The tracks needed to be established and maintained, if not using existing ones. And I would also emphasize, if you're going to build a linear earthwork to control the landscape visually, you do need to do a mass job of deforestation, not only because you might be using some of that wood in a palisade or other watchtowers and features along the dike, uh, beacons, uh, but you may also need to keep clear lines of sight. So I think in addition to the earth moving, we have to think about deforestation as a major labor to manage the immediate western frontage of this linear earthwork as it traverses hills valleys and slopes and uh, um and, and and controls visually and, uh, and 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 physically the landscape to its west and part of this, this is to give you one example to show you how Office Dyke works on a local scale. And here we are really informed by Ray and Baptiste's work, which not a, takes forward uh, Hill and Worthington, who talk about how the monument precisely um, blocks and manages the landscape to actually show how even its construction in short segments and it, its careful use of topography to dominate and intimidate Lands, the lands, anyone coming from the west, they see this impressive work, earthwork, and this is a view in the in very in the black line of the surviving earthwork of uh, Bron above Bronnegarth in the Kerryog Valley, showing you how the monument sort of dominates the skyline as you approach. And also here in this photograph, you can see Offa's Dyke. Um, you can see Offa's Dyke sort of curving actually it doesn't it actually is built in straight lens but it sort of enters into the valley and allow and and takes an ad and that's taken about here how it curves in to dominate views over the valley to the west and there's church castle sitting on a site that may have been uh, an ideal site for a fort or earlier mercian fortification at least a mercian lookout point and here I, I've, I've simplified the contours to help visualize how the monument's working here here's the here's the afon Kariog and the arrows are just to make the point this is a biaxial monument it's about controlling movement along the valley along the river on the river bank the valley sides but also perhaps protecting north south communication routes up um and along this line of movement so you could you, you're perhaps it's better to understand Offers Dyke as blocking and overlooking, but not simply about east west communication, but also about north south communication. And while the whole topic, Ray and Bapti address the whole topic of gateways and whether we have them, and this is still open to discussion, there are points where there are angle turns in the dike, as shown in this aerial photograph of Hergen Corner, as it's known, in the Clun Forest, where the monument does a, an angle turn, a, a, a marked turn of angle, where it, it is at least likely there may have once been a gate. And this is about funneling traffic towards a discrete point where you can overlook it and manage uh, access through and we're looking here sort of east south east over the clun uh, forest the clun hills um and you can see that would be the mercian side although i said don't, don't think of it as a border and but this would be the welsh side um but that you will hear controlling access. And this would be about movements of people and livestock and not simply about preventing raiding, but controlling, uh, presumably, um, the taxation and tribute and trade in animals and other resources. But the challenge we have in understanding this monument is that we tend to understand it almost exclusively as a land locked and land division and this wonderful aerial photograph again by Julian Ravist of Atlanta Hill looking southwards uh, Knighton is in the far distance over there and comes Sanon Hill and so on but Offers Dyke is basically running along that ridge and then dropping down to Garbutt Hall and then coming up on this wonderful sweep and almost every TV documentary and every program about Offers Dyke will embody, encapsulate this this part of the Clun Forest as the typical Offers Dyke. The problem with this is it's landlocked. It only shows how the monument works in, uh, in uh, above ground. 
And so my point would be that Offa's Dyke is perhaps con never considered hydraulic, uh, manipulating, managing, connecting to water. And perhaps it should be. And part of our ongoing research should challenge this bias. And part of it is a walking bias. Offers Dyke, at least in part, is a long distance walking trail, which for long distances, but not the whole distance of the surviving monument, uh, you know, it follows the monument. And the walking experience in the summer of upland views and vistas from the dike gives that a sense of a dryland context. Um, the earthwork survival bias underpins this, that we have it best surviving in the uplands where it hasn't been subject to later agriculture and uh, the effects of water. So by definition, the earthwork will survive better where it's away from water courses and from agriculture uh, in more fertile valley bottoms. So we naturally sort of see Offa's Dyke as unrelated to water. Another part is part of the challenge is our terminology. We call these dikes land divisions, earthworks, monuments. They are, are ways of moving earth, moving stone. There's sto actually there's a whole argument made by David Hill and now Keith Ray and Ian Bapti that, that the stonework may have been an integral part of the, the monument in many places, both naturally scarped back uh, uh, natural bedrock, but also maybe dry stone walling used on top or as a revetment for the monument. But that's but the, either way, it's seen as about moving earth and stone. It's not seen as about managing water in any regard. We So the terminology is part of the problem. And when we talk about it, about controlling, we, we tend to think about land, travel, trade, communication, territory, conflict, power and authority that is navigated by land-based movement, uh, people, moving of people, of animals, raiders on horseback or uh, droving cattle, uh, raiding cattle. We, we, we conceptualise it in those landlocked terms. Um, and indeed, there's been no consistent research focus on the adaptions and translation of water courses in these narratives. So my research is now trying to sort of counter that. And there's good reason to do it, because looking at early medieval linear earthworks, um, there's lots of reasons already in the literature why a landlocked perspective is an inappropriate or biased one. And Keith Ray on the Offers Night Collaboratory website does address this, but I, I want to make the point that only a handful of his 100 research questions explicitly relate to water. So he's factoring in hydraulics to the dikes, um, and he's thought about this already in his publication with Ian Bapti. This is already a feature but it's perhaps underplayed. And we need to see Offers Dyke and Watts Dyke in comparative terms in this regard. And he asked the question, how did the dike approach and relate to the major rivers it encounters? Why does the dike approach more minor river valleys in the various ways that it does? Uh, and are there clear recurrences in such approaches? I mean, these are really important questions. And he says, how did the dike uh, negotiate immediate um, crossings of minor rivers rather than the relatively whole valleys. And are there, are there other landscape features related to the dike and contemporary with it, such as road systems, river ports, trading places, markets, defending positions, settlements and field boundaries? Another reason why we should think of Offa's Dyke in relation to water is the broader European context. We know that in the 7th, 8th century, um, polities and communities were undergoing not only local um, excavation works, uh, but large scale building projects. Most famously is uh, Charlemagne's failed attempt to build um, a canal um, between the Rhine and the Danube um, so that uh, tributaries, so that uh, transport can actually connect up the whole of Europe, a, a major endeavour uh, of earth building that is it, 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 that relates to the ability of a, a major ruler, an imperial figure, of aspirations, that imperial title, um, to move earth on a scale that um, shows his power, his authority, but also his interest in trade and burgeoning economy. Anglo-Saxon England, the kingdoms of the 7th to 9th century, uh, uh, reveals some evidence that uh, canal building was starting in this period. And uh, John Blair's work suggests maybe in Kent from the, um, you know, from this period, we can see maybe uh, no, elsewhere, you know, earthworks were being constructed on a scale that hadn't been seen since Roman Britain.
And certainly from 950, from the middle of the 10th century through to the 13th century, canal buildings taking place across Europe. So in terms of major engineering works relating to water courses and keeping this quite broad, Offa's Dyke has a watery context here. Um, Here's another one from the early 8th century, the Carnhava Canal, which we have specifically dated to the 726, cutting across this um, um, Baltic island um, to the north of Funen, uh, east of Jutland, um, to control and manage uh, tr transportation through complex shallow waters and navigation and controlling that trade, I imagine. So we have this evidence of, um, in this sort of immediately pre-Viking era, um, that, that, that local um, elites and communities, as well as broader polities, are engaging in large-scale earthwork activities relating to water transportation and water control. And a, another example, which I think is a good parallel in some ways for Offa's Dyke, is the Danaverka. Um, so we're on the, the very sort of uh, on, the, on, the, on the stem of the um, the, the peninsula of Jutland um, in what is now North Germany, but historically was on the borderlands of the Danish kingdom as it was emerging in the early Middle Ages at various stages, uh, spits and starts. We have the Danaverka, which we can date as a complex multi-phase monument dating from the 5th to the 12th century, but in essence is various stages of attempts to control not only land travel north and south along the Jutland Peninsula, Peninsula, but also to manage and control water transport up the Ida and the Treen and along the Schleifjord um, to, to, by the Viking Age, through the, um, the proto-town of Hedeby or Heithebu. And so we have to think about a mo um, this monument, the Danaverka, in both landward terrestrial terms but also in relation to water courses and potential military but also pr primarily economic interactions you know, trade and uh, seafaring trade using this 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 riverine um and uh, fjord um link east west allowing transportation from the north sea to the baltic and the baltic to the north sea so it's no surprise that Hedemi emerges in this borderland zone, a zone that was about control of land movements, um, east to north to south, but also east-west uh, um, transportation, transshipment. And through the first millennium AD from Scandinavia, we now have good substantiated evidence and some well-dated examples from the late Roman Iron Age through the migration period uh, up to the Viking Age of various sea uh, fjord barriers, um, inlet barriers to control and protect, presumably against raiding, but also potentially to manage and control trading through um, this um, potentially uh, fluid, uh, but also a complex to manage landscape. So here's a sort of artist reconstruction of the um, the R. I don't even know how you say this A barrier um, near hardest left um, in in Jutland, but also here the famous uh, scuppering of ships in Roskilde Fjord to dredge a channel to manage a channel uh, along Roskilde Fjord um, on, on Zealand. So we have examples there. So my my simple point is I'm not saying any of these are a parallel for Offers Dyke, but there's an a priori logic to thinking about Offers Dyke as built and managed in relation to water courses and relation to controlling land and riverine, wetland and maritime communications. Part of this context is, is of course, looking at navigable water courses in Anglo-Saxon England. And um, John Blair pulls this together for his Oxford University Press collection on waterways and canals and makes the point that, well, by the later Middle Ages, these are the main major rivers and arteries of communication. And we can see here that this, the line of Officer's Dyke can be perhaps seen primarily in relation to these and, and the link between the Severn and the Dee. And that's a simple point I want to make. Uh, and therefore, there is, again, another a priori, priori reason for seeing Offers Dyke in relation to water courses. So what I've done so far in this talk is given you that background to the Offers Dyke Collaboratory. I've given you some insights into the logic of why I'm interested in 
offers Dyke and how it works as a statement of power, but also a military and socioeconomic uh, line of control, but not a border. And I've suggested there's a there's a logic. Uh, given the early medieval European context for seeing Offers Dyke as a hydraulic work, as related to controlling, manipulating and managing water and movement through a watery set of landscapes um, on different scales. Having done that, I'll take a break now and give you a bit of a pause. And in the second video, I will pursue some of the evidence of what we actually have for how Offers Dyke did interact with water. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to Howard Williams on YouTube. In addition, consider following the Archeodeath WordPress blog at howardwilliamsblog.wordpress.com.